So Tim and uh, Shelly and Pops and Janice are, are all in Oklahoma. And um, Wednesday morning, they're intending to fly out early morning flight to Dallas and then drive from Dallas to Oklahoma. And they, uh, the flight was canceled because of bad weather around Dallas. I don't know if you know, but the weather in Oklahoma and da in Texas has been terrible in the early part of the week. And um, so their flight was canceled. So they all piled into a minivan and they drove to Oklahoma City. And so, uh, well, you know, Tim is always looking for an excuse for a road trip. So <laughs> I don't think it took too much persuasion for him. Um, so anyway, they, they left Wednesday morning, got there Thursday night. Uh, and then Tim was at a 1040 board meeting on Friday, did a wedding. Um, just happened to be someone that used to go to New Hope that moved there and did a wedding there on Saturday. So the timing was, well, God-driven. And... Um, and then Sunday, today, he's preaching at Ardmore, at the church in Ardmore. So I think he's doubled the congregation because he brought a bunch of people from Texas. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was 12 of them coming, and I think that doubled the congregation at Ardmore Church today. So that's good. Um, anyway, we have an announcement video, so please watch the screen for the video. Good morning. I'm Brent Sraven of the Elder Board here at New Hope Church. We're so thankful you guys could be here today. As we prepare our hearts for worship, we trust that our hearts are soft and open to where God is leading each of you. Enjoy today's service. The next men's breakfast is on June the 8th. And this month, why don't you bring a friend? What better way to introduce the New Hope men's ministry than with a delicious breakfast? Coffee's on at 7.30, we eat at 8. So come along, join us, and bring someone with you. Our next seniors luncheon is right around the corner. It will be a potluck lunch and our theme is tips on planting. Following lunch, we will have an Abbott and Costello movie. Hope to see you there. Traditionally, we do Sunday evening services on the first Sunday of every month. But summer is upon us, so we'll be taking a break and coming back in the fall with our Sunday evening services. Well, it's time for us to start the second phase of Build the Barn funding project. We have a very special date that we would like for you to save. It's coming up on the 15th of September. That is a Sunday evening. It's gonna be right here at New Hope Church. It's gonna be a barbecue and it's free. There's going to be live music. There's gonna be a live and silent auction. And we're even going to have a very special country store where you can purchase homemade jams, homemade aprons, all kinds of special gifts that'll be there. And all this is gonna to go to the Barn Fundraising Project. This is an opportunity for you to invite friends, family, neighbors to a special event at the church. And they can be part of helping us build the barn. I hope you'll save the date and invite your friends and family to come join us for that very special evening. All right, well, just a few other announcements. Well, first, you heard about the men's breakfast on June the 8th. If you know, uh, if you know college football, you might know the story of Inky Johnson. We're going to be watching his testimony on video uh, on that breakfast, and then there'll be a devotion after that. Uh, seniors potluck, there's a sign-up sheets going around for that, uh, the seniors thing. That'll be about sort of spring, springtime planting and growing, and then as we get into that season. Um, and then dads and grads. So on... In two weeks' time, we'll be doing Graduation Sunday combined with Father's Day. Normally, we do them separately, but this year, we're going to do them together. Um, and last year, uh, Father's Day, we had more people than Mother's Day, which was the first time that's ever happened. Because normally, Father's Day is kind of slim on the attendance side. So last year, we had more people on Father's Day than Mother's Day, but we had a lot of people on Mother's Day this year. So there's a lot to live up to for this year. So Father's Day be here. We're all helping. It'll help that fact we have graduation Sunday as well. Which will... So dads and grads, two weeks time. Also time to bring back the change for babies. Baby bottles full of, uh, full of coins or if you just want to put a check in there, that'll be great too. Uh, but the check should be payable to the Pregnancy Care Center, not New Hope. Uh, that'll be a direct contribution. Um, Jen and I just want to thank you for the pasta feed. That was really great. We had a lot of donations for, for raffle, a lot of donations for uh, food. We thank you if you just made a cash donation and couldn't make it. That's that's great, too. It all goes to the same place. So uh, we raised just over $4,500, uh, which will be going towards Kids Camp for the fourth to sixth graders, through sixth graders that are going to Heartland this year. Uh, and I think we have almost 40 kids going up this year, which is a record. 
Last year we broke the record, this year we're breaking the record again. So that's great to see so many kids wanting to go up. Uh, Sunday school teachers. This time of year we do see kind of some of our teachers drift off uh, after teaching through the school year here at Sunday school, uh, which is fine. And some people have been doing it a long time, some people short time, but we appreciate their service in the Sunday school. But we do need teachers on an ongoing basis. And I know this is a very difficult time of year to ask you know, teachers that teach in schools to teach in Sunday school because they're getting to the end of the school year and they're saying, I'm done. Thank you very much, but no, I need to take a break. Uh, but we still need Sunday school teachers. So. If you happen to be a teacher in a school, you have a spiritual gift. It would be great if you could pass it on to the kids, pass your knowledge on to the kids here at, at church as well. So it's not a every Sunday commitment. It's month on, month off. You don't need to know everything about the Bible. You don't need to know everything uh, about everything. You just need to be able to read a curriculum and be able to teach it that curriculum. Um, it's not terribly difficult. I started off doing that, and I had no idea what I was doing. But... Um, it seemed to work out okay in the end. So the curriculum is all supplied to you, so it's not a big deal. Um, so if you're interested in doing that, also we're looking for um, substitute teachers. So, you know, if someone can't turn up on a Sunday who's teaching, if they're sick or they're out of town, then we need substitute teachers as well. So if you happen to be around, you know, on Sundays and you just think, well, I, I could teach if I'm, I'm here anyway, so just, uh, just contact Jen. Her number and her email is on... Uh, is in the bulletin. Uh, Amazon Smile, we just, if you're not familiar with Amazon Smile, Amazon Smile is when you go shopping on Amazon, you can register or you can connect yourself with a nonprofit, and then every time you buy something that qualifies under Amazon Smile, 0.5% of the proceeds or of that sale or that purchase goes towards the charity that you choose. So you, if you buy a lot of stuff on Amazon, which I know we all do, even though everyone says shop local, but... Amazon seems to be doing very well, and um, you can shop on Amazon and give to the church at the same time. Anything that, ha that comes through Amazon Smile goes to the Barn Project. So if you want to do that and you haven't registered with another charity and you'd like to do that, then we have put New Hope on that uh, Amazon Smile so you can register and, get, and uh, we can get money every time you shop. You don't even have to give it. They give it. You just shop. Simple. And the instructions on how to do that are in the bulletin as well. Um, don't forget baptism, 30th of June. If you're interested in baptism, just write it on a Connect card, put it in the offering, uh, and then we'll, we'll communicate with you about how that works. Uh, if you could put what service you want to be baptized in as well, that will help Angel in the office uh, just to get a feel for how many people in each service. So far, I think we have 13 or 14. Uh, so we've already got a good number. But if you're interested in baptism, that'll be the end of this month. Um, VBS. So I want to bring up VBS. It's a little early. It's in July, but uh, it's good to bring it up now because registration is now open. Uh, we'll be having a link on the website the latter part of this week, so look for that if you want to register for VBS. It's on July 15th through the 18th, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., so it's a morning VBS this time. We alternate between morning and evening every year. Uh, the Mr. J Band will be back. They, they were here last year. Um, and they just did a great job. They really, we got better feedback from last year's VBS than any other. We also have more kids last year than any other. We had 150 kids last year, and we're hoping to get at least that this year. There is no cost to VBS. Even if kids can only come a couple of days out of the, out of the four, that's fine. Just as long as they register, and let us know. So that registration will be, it's already up, but there'll be a link um, on the website in the latter part of this week. So get kids registered, ready for VBS. And uh, the Mr. J Band is doing Monsters Under My Bed is their subject, uh, which I've seen all but one of their shows, and, and this one was my favorite. It's the first one he ever wrote, and it's his favorite too, so he does a really good job with it. It's about being in the darkness. Jesus is the light. Uh, great message for the kids. Uh, the Daniel Plan, we met uh, on Wednesday, so we had a Daniel Plan reunion on Wednesday. We had about 25 people here, which was great, um, and Maureen gave a testimony, which was awesome, and, um, and a, a great testimony to what the Daniel Plan can really do. Uh, we will be having a small group for that, a monthly meeting of a small group, uh, so the dates for that will come out soon. If you're interested in joining that small group, let me know, and I'll put you on the communication list so that you can get um, all the information about that. Even if you didn't participate in the Daniel Plan January and February, it doesn't matter. Just let me know, and we can make sure that you get information about it. Uh, again, no evening service tonight. Um, we're taking a break. Probably October will be the next one that we come back with our evening service on the first Sunday of the month. So no evening service tonight if you're planning to come to that. Um, prayer. 
prayer requests. There's, there's quite a few prayer requests in the bulletin. I'd like you to read through them. Prayer is very, very important. Uh, if you need prayer, fill out the Connect card that's in front of you. Um, we're happy to pray for you. Monday or Tuesday, uh, we'll read through the cards. We'll pray for you as a staff and uh, make sure that you any communication to our prayer team also goes out. So that's critical. If you need prayer, put it on the card or you know someone that needs prayer, and we'll be happy to do that. Also, the Connect cards are there if you have a change of address or if you have information that you want to give to the staff here or to Angel at the front desk, then um, just put it on the Connect card. And if you're new here, well, welcome, and we'd love to send you some information about the church. So uh, if you would put your name and address on the connect card, then we'll do that uh, through snail mail. Okay, uh, I'd like to ask our ushers to come forward for our morning tithes and offerings, and we're going to pray. Heavenly Father, we're just grateful for this season, the beginning of this season, and it's the end of a season for some. As people graduate high school, they graduate college, uh, it's the end of that season for them but they're about to start a new season. So, Lord, we just lift up all the graduates today as they go through graduation ceremonies, graduation parties, and they just either decide what it is they want to do next or they go on to do what they've planned to do next. So, Lord, we just lift them up to you and ask them to bless them in everything that they do. And we ask that, uh, that they look to you for guidance uh, for the correct path that they need to take. Uh, Lord, Franklin Graham had asked churches to pray for President Trump this morning. But I want to be broader than that. I think it's important that the whole branch of government who runs this country be prayed for and that this country be prayed for and that we find direction through the leadership of this country. So, Lord, we lift up to you today everybody in government and we just ask that they look to you for guidance. Look to you to find your kingdom in everything that they do so that they can represent this country not just here but overseas in such a way that honors you and not themselves. So, Lord, we just do that at the national level. We do it at the state level, and we do it here at the city level. Our leaders need your guidance. They need your wisdom. So, Lord, we just ask that you be there when they seek you and that you will find obvious ways to communicate to them what it is they should be doing to help lead us in the right direction. Lord, we pray for Ardmore Church this morning. We pray for growth there. We pray for, for Tim as he's preaching, and we just, we just pray that they will uh, hear the message and that there will be uh, widespread excitement about Ardmore Church, the church on the hill. So, Lord, we pray this and more. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. to get to spend a little bit of time with all of you and hear more about your stories and hear your passions about community because this is needed. God existed in community and then he built us in community. And so we were built for it, but it's difficult. It's so difficult. And so I'm gonna start there. What are some of the barriers that you've seen in your life and your friends' lives to actually having deep, deep friendship and community? Lack of trust and fear of being being known and not loved. Mm. Yeah. So it's better to be unknown. Yes, because it's safer. <laughs> yes. Then I know you don't like me, no, you don't know me. But if you know me and you don't love me. Ouch. Like the fact that we're both sinners, <laughs> you know, in a friendship. We're going to hurt each other. We're going to disappoint one another. Um, I think that's a barrier. Like you said, it takes trust to be known. And to be known means we'll see our flaws. And to know someone else means we'll see theirs. It's painful. Especially when you start to get really deep with somebody, right? Like you can keep a surface level friendship and that can be fine. But what's the need for that? Why even go deep with people? What's, what's the result of actually having deep 
friends and your business? When we're able to be our, our true, authentic selves and able to be transparent, that gives us an opportunity, it gives our friends an opportunity to help us through the pruning process that God puts us through. I think you feel less alone. I've been through some really hard things in life and have had a friend that already walked through those things and to hear her say, I know you can't, you can't understand that there is more life to live after this hard thing, but I'm on the other side of that. And I can tell you, like, let me walk alongside you. Because sometimes you go through a hard thing, you feel like you're the only person struggling with that. And I think having deep friendships where people can feel vulnerable enough to say, I've also experienced that loss. I also understand what it's like to have this hard moment happen. It makes me feel like I can make it through those tough things. Less alone. I like those words. I think we all crave those words, but it does feel really difficult, doesn't it? But I just liked hearing it from their mouths about friendship. And so that's what we're going to talk about this morning is friendship and spiritual warfare. I know those don't sound like they go together so much, um, but I think, I really think that they do. And we're going to uh, explore that this morning. There's a quote, uh, blood is thicker than water. Most people, per, you know, use that to mean that family, family above everything, right? And, um, and then there's kind of this other possible origin. Some historians say there's no basis for the origin. Um, others do. Meredith Gray and Gray's Anatomy used the other origin, so it must make it accurate. I don't know. So the other origin is that blood is thicker than water could mean that was something that soldiers going to war together would say, right? So this concept that people going to battle together have a bond even stronger than family because they've gone through the battle together. I think either one is acceptable because we are family in Christ through the blood of Jesus, right? And we're in spiritual battle together. So either way, we are thicker than water, right? Um, and then, quite frankly, the best war movies are really about best friends. Right, come on, right? It's about loyalty and camaraderie and friendship. It's not all about like Rambo. I don't even know if I've ever seen that one. I've seen the ones about friendship, the ones that's um, I shared a couple Sunday evenings ago um, that I had just finished reading Tony Evans' book, Warfare. And I've just, I, I keep going back to it and, and I'm really interested in, in what he has to say and it's brought some, some things to my attention. And some of it that my, my purchase of it and starting to read it came from, um, I'd been having well, I, I, I have anxiety, but it was getting a little bit more acute and specific. Um, and I definitely, there's biology involved in family history. It was getting really, really specific, and it was making me question some things and look a little deeper. And realizing that um, part of what was happening is that I was talking to people about it. My friends, I was sharing kind of these thoughts that I was having. I'll spare you the details, um, but some 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 fairly specific OCD kind of symptoms, these sort of thoughts, right? And I was sharing them with friends and they were being good friends back and listening to me. And it helped to hear me say these crazy things out loud and then I'd hear how absurd they were and it would calm me down and I could move on. Or they would tell me, that's a crazy thought and then I could move on. And, and so this was helping me deal with it. But then I started to reflect and I realized more than ever, my conversations were, had started to become about me. And they were about these things that weren't even like true or happening or relevant to anything. They were just some time and space was being taken up by, by something not important. And it's, I started to wonder, is, this, is there something happening here, right? Is the evil one trying to distract me? Is he trying to take these bonds that I've built with people and turn them into something that's not blessing God in, in, all, in, in all those areas? And so I started to, um, to explore that thought that maybe there was a reason that I was in, being engaged in, in some spiritual warfare. So I started to read the book and, um, and learned a lot. So 
We're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, we'll start in Ephesians 6. I'll try. If I didn't have my little cheater tabs, we'd be here all day. Um, chapter 6, starting in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. So we know we're engaged in spiritual warfare, not just things that are happening in our lives, but stuff that's going up on here that we can't see. It's happening. And so it's sometimes helpful to understand it a little bit. Um, and then in Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Nope. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the good news is we're in this battle, but it's been won. So there's time and space going on here. It's happening, but it's been won. There's nothing that's going to separate us from God. It's not going to work. The evil one can try and try and try, but God, will, it won't work to separate the love that he has for us. So we can, he can try to discourage us. He can try to tell us little lies, but they're not true. Jesus loves us, and he's fighting on our behalf. Um, I love this verse because I think the reason why I did think about spiritual warfare as I was starting to process some of these things is because I had experienced it in high school, and that's when I first started to understand sort of what had been going on. And this verse convinced me that even though I had been through this struggle and I was questioning um, I had doubts and I had fears and I felt shame and all those things that none of that separated me from the love of God, that he was at work the whole time to steer me back to the plan that he has for me. So every time I, I hear that, I'm encouraged as we go through these difficult times. And maybe we're afraid we're going to make a mistake or we're afraid we're going to mess something up. I'm reminded that God is at work in this. He's not sending us out to battle and saying, you go, good soldier, right? He's in it with us. He goes before us. There's a plan. Um, Tony Evans explains the tactics of the evil one. He, uh, he says that Satan questions God's authority, right, in the garden. Did God really say, right? He starts to plant those seeds of doubt. And then Tony Evans says, questioning God's word is the devil's trick to get you to overlook and underappreciate God's goodness. And it made me think about how often in Scripture God demonstrates the importance of community and friendship, and yet I don't, I think we maybe underappreciate or overlook its value. We focus on other things, and I wonder if it's because it's so important in our, in our spiritual battle. Our togetherness and our community is so important, um, and we'll look at some verses that show that, that when Satan downplays it, us spending time together, us loving one another, um, he, he's, he's infiltrating that and affecting evangelism. Uh, since we are in a battle, we need an army, right? It, it, it makes sense that we would need each other. And that's why I think friendship and community is so important to God. In the series, Not Alone, Jenny Allen spoke about how she had been... Get, 
speaking at a conference, and she mentioned that she and Amina Brown, who was also in there speaking, she mentioned casually that they were friends while she was sharing. And afterwards, um, Amina Brown came up to her and said, Jenny, you said that we're friends, but we're not friends. <laughs> and Jenny said back to her, well, you're going to have to explain that because I thought we were friends, so I don't know why you're saying that. And Amina Brown said, we're not friends until we have broken bread together. And um, they talked about how that, that word friendship is used in a variety of ways, right? We can click that we're friends, click we're friends, click we're unfriends, right? And Amina Brown was saying, that's, that's not how it works. Until we have broken bread together and engaged with one another, we're not friends. We may know one another, we may like each other, but we're not friends. And so I googled um, times when Jesus broke bread or ate with people, and there's lessons on this. So yes, you could have you could have gotten today's message on the internet, but then you wouldn't be amongst friends. So it's, it's good that you're here. So I came across an article um, from the Gospel Coalition by Aaron Menkoff, and he says, so many of us have read good books on marriage and discipling, but I wonder how many of us have read a good book on what it means to be a friend. Not many is my guess. It surprises me that few books on friendship are read or perhaps that so few books on friendship are written. Not all of us are called to be husbands or wives, but we are all called to be friends. And I think that's part of what I enjoyed so much about this Not Alone series. Um, it was because I think a lot about community. I mean, that's what small groups is about, right? But I don't know that I've spent a lot of time thinking about the value, importance, and power in friendships, in that accountability and intimacy and knowing each other and not being less alone and the value in that. So Menikoff uses talks a lot about John 15, so we'll go there. He uses that to explain some of this. Um, John 15, the beginning part of it talks about when Jesus is saying, I'm the vine and you are the branches, that it all starts with him, right? Abiding in him. He is our source of nourishment, our, our strength, all of that. Our purpose is first in Christ. And then the branches that produce fruit. And he explains what this means in verse, starting in verse 7. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I told you this so that joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. He's saying, abide in me and follow my commands. I've modeled this for you. And for what purpose? Joy. Joy. And so then what is the command? He's saying, keep my commands, remain in me. What's the command? Verse 12, my command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. He said, I brought you into the inner circle. You know, you know what's going on. You know what's happening here. And we see that, I think it's funny when we talk about that friendship and community is hard. I think that sounds weird. I think we think it's easier than it is, right? Like being with people should be easy. And yet when it comes down to it, when you look at your calendar, when you look at when you're spending time with people and what you're doing with those people, it actually is kind of hard. And then why is it hard? And we realize here, because there is that sacrifice piece to it, right? Um, the laying down your life for your friends. So it does, it is not easy. He's not saying it's all, it's all coffee and, and donuts, right? It is their sacrifice involved in friendship, but it's for a reason and it's a command. Um, 
And we saw that in the video. They talk about what's good about friendship is to, to know and be known, to grow and go through the pruning process, to have fun and joy, and to be less alone. And so the article asks these questions. Do I take initiative in my friendship? And when you think about that, do I take initiative in my friendship? You see that's what Jesus is doing. He's modeling this friendship. He's going out first and gathering people. Zacchaeus, he says, come down. Today I'm going to your house and we're going to hang out. Right? He's initiating those friendships. Sometimes we wait, right? And we maybe get frustrated when people don't come to us or invite us. And we get a little, we get discouraged or we get, feel left out. But we see that Jesus modeled to take initiative. Put yourself out there, right? Pursue. And then the next question was, do I sacrifice in my friendships? That might be setting aside some of your plans on your calendars because your friend needs you may even mean maybe you deal with difficulties a certain way and your friend deals with it another way, right? Maybe you have the solution to their their issue and you've told them this solution the first three times you've had this conversation. And then you see their number come up and you go, oh my gosh, they're just going to want to talk about it again. That's the sacrifice, right? Answering and listening again because maybe they're not ready to do your solution or what seems so obvious. They're not there yet. So your sacrifice is maybe listening again. The other question is, do I appreciate my friends for who they are or what they can give me? Are your friendships about filling your cup? Right? And then when they're not filling your cup, you say, you're not bringing me joy anymore, you're out. Right? Or, or um, do you appreciate them for who they are? They no longer have the boat. Are they still your friends? Right? <laughs> do, do I want close friends? Is that even something that you desire or is it scary? Is it too much of a time commitment? Is it not something you're used to? That could be the stretch that that Jesus is putting you in. Um, Do I have godly expectations for friendship? And what that question means is, do I accept sacrifice from my friends? Is there reciprocity? Or when they offer to help, do I say, no, 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 that's too much, and not let them give to you? Desiree Van Binsbergen would always say, don't, like she'd offer, go to offer a compliment, and if you would like start to shut it down, she'd say, stop, don't take my blessing. That's my blessing. I'm, you know, I gave you a compliment, or I'm giving you these cookies, or I'm bringing this to your house. No, 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 nope, 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 nope. Don't, don't interfere with my blessing, right? This is blessing me to do this. And sometimes we maybe inadvertently have a power imbalance with our friends because we won't let them listen to us. We won't let them give us something or sacrifice for us, and we are stealing their blessing of doing that. Um, Do I bear with my friends? Or do we have so many options, we have 352 on our Facebook, that when we don't like what's happening, we can just unfriend, right? I still have 274 friends. Or do we bear with them? One of my best friend's sister in Christ wrote me a letter one time telling me I was not being a good friend. Um, because I was not making time for her. And my response was not probably what she was looking for. I didn't say, I'm so sorry, I will make more time for you, which is probably what a good friend would have done. But at the time I said, this is all I have. And she's still my friend, right? She didn't say, look, I tried. I told you what I needed. I communicated with you and you still didn't. She's still my friend and she's she bears with me because I'm sometimes not a good friend. Um, so in that, um, and part of it's because I do struggle a little bit with 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 friends and socializing um, because I'm a little bit task oriented and I, I like productivity and I'm kind of busy. And then when I'm not busy, I don't want to leave my house. So like once I'm home and the shoes have come off. 
I don't want to go do anything. I don't necessarily want to answer the phone. There's group texts that will like go all night long and I just put my phone away and I, I'll, I'll talk to them later. I sometimes just can be like that. Um, and then watching this, I realized that these friendships are not frivolous. They aren't wasting time. That they're a commandment and they bring joy and that's evangelism, right? And so that has helped me realize that I, I need to make time for those friendships, even if it feels maybe frivolous or what's being a, do they need something? You know, like if you need me, I'm there, but if it's just to drink coffee, well, if it's coffee, I'll probably be there too, but, <laughs> but some of you know what I'm talking about. I just, there's just, there's a lot to be done, right? And so sometimes it just seems silly to have just frivolous moments. And this is I think a little bit of the deception, did God really say you're supposed to be friends, right? A little bit of that deception that we don't need it. And that's what he does. He, Satan tells us that we're either too bad to be friends, right? No one wants our friendship. You're better off alone. Or he tells us we're too good. You don't need those people. You don't need God. You don't need friends. You're too good. It's usually one or the other. And either way, he's isolating us from people. And yet we're going to battle. It doesn't make any sense. It makes sense for him. Isolate us in battle. That's perfect, right? Because together in battle is a different story. And Jesus, we look at this as not frivolity. It's not not that big of a deal. If you look at Jesus' ministry, he spends his whole time modeling this. So um, he spends time loving others, serving others, breaking bread with them. Um, and then he prepares to leave them physically because that's kind of a big deal. He's poured himself into them, spent time with them, traveled together, sat and ate with them, and then he's going to die physically and be resurrected and there might be some feelings about that, right? So he prepares them for that as well and assures them, I'm leaving you with each other and the Holy Spirit. And he keeps repeating that and they don't get it. We know that, right? It dawns on them later, which is some of my favorite parts of scripture. But John, so John chapter 16, starting in verse 28 he tells them, I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I'm leaving the world and going back to the Father. Then Jesus' disciples said, now you're speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. You believe at last, Jesus answered, but a time is coming. I'm so glad you believe a time is coming when it's going to get hard. You need to remember these things, right? But a time is coming and has come when you'll be scattered each to his own home. You will leave me all alone, yet I'm not alone, for my Father is with me. And I think that reminds them that when you're scattered, you're not alone either. Your friend may be over here. The group of us are not going to be together, but you're not alone. Just like I'm not alone because the Father is with me, you're not alone because the Father is with you and I am with you. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. There is a battle, but we've won. It's okay, but be ready to, to do this battle together. And then he goes on to pray for them to prepare them for this time. And then he prays for us too. Chapter 17, starting in verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's us. That all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Evangelism. That they're together in unity with me and with each other. That's how the world will know something is real. I don't know where I went. There we are. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Our friendship with God and our friendship with each other is evangelism. evangelism. So isn't it logical that Satan would attack 
or interfere with our community and friendships. Tony Evans said some things about spiritual warfare that stood out to me. One of them was, the reasons there are so many casualties among believers in spiritual warfare is that we've lost sight of the fact that we're in a perpetual state of warfare, which demands constant alertness. And so we let down our guards. We open ourselves to attack. We forget we are warriors, not tourists in God's kingdom on earth. And one of Satan's strategies, though, is to get us to forget that we are fighting a spiritual battle and instead focus on the physical, tangible challenges we face. So sometimes we're in a very comfortable state. Things are good, so we don't realize we're in a battle. That's a strategy of the evil one. Sometimes we're consumed with the trials that are right in front of us that we miss that we're in a spiritual battle. And then another thing he says is too many believers in Jesus Christ act as if they are soldiers on screen instead of a real war. They dress up nice, smile and wave, and want to know how to keep in step rather than how to go to war. That takes us back to Ephesians 6, right? That armor of God. Therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You're putting on the armor so that when the battle comes, not the battle's coming and now I'm going to prepare, now I'm going to get ready. Because by then those flaming arrows of the evil one have already come our way and we don't have our armor. So we need to be ready. Tony Evans says that Satan attacks us on four fronts, and they make sense. The first one is the individual front, right? Temptation and sin. He likes to shame us and tell us we're not worthy and render us useless and powerless, right? So he he seeks to destroy us by tempting us and with sin. And then on the family front, he says, Evans says, he wants to destroy you and the next generation too. If Satan can get to the next generation by messing up our homes, then he has us, our kids, and the homes they will establish someday because our children will be ill-equipped to raise their children properly. Spiritual warfare then becomes a generational problem. That's like that's a heavy statement, right? And so that's, I think we just forget and we just live our lives and take things as they come and there's something bigger um, going on here. And the third one is the church front. He says here he promotes disunity, division, and discrimination through things such as personality squabbles and power struggles and through more serious problems such as doctrinal error, racism, chauvinism, and culturalism. And then the last one he talks about is the society as a whole and recognizing that Satan can exert influence over the world's leaders and structures and to recognize that. His method of attack is to divide, isolate, and deceive. So we see that friendships and unity and community are essential to protecting us from those attacks specifically. So what interferes with finding, building, and maintaining those kinds of friendships? Is it the time and effort that it takes? Is it your own value for what What is it worth, Um, what you're getting or not getting from it, or maybe it's the vulnerability that it takes, that known and being known and the risks that some of these women shared. So we, we call our small groups here at New Hope, hope groups, right? Helping other people engage. One, because it says hope. The other ones would be like, like when people hang out with each other, those don't make good sounds, but hope, help other people engage, shows that we know it's not just what I'm getting from that group, right? But I'm, I'm engaging so that we can engage together, right? And then the purpose or the, the, um, the purpose within those hope groups is to connect, grow, reach, and serve. And so there's some definite scriptures where we see Jesus doing those things in the times that he broke bread with people. 
um, connect, grow, reach, and serve. So we're going to look at those quickly. I know I'm running out of time, um, but it's been a while, so I have lots of things to say. And so you can tell Tim that I talked about Jesus too much and see how he feels about that. <laughs> so we're going to look at Luke 5, starting in verse 27. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at a tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. Initiated that, right? Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house. He's so excited he throws a party. Well, his friends are there, right? So... It was a large crowd of tax collectors, and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So here we see Jesus breaking bread and being with people to reach right? To reach out to them, to evangelize, to show the joy that's been complete in him, to show the bonds of unity and friendship. He's reaching and sharing, sharing the truth with others through this breaking of bread and friendship. And then in Luke 9, we see service, that they use breaking of bread with one another to serve. The feeding of the 5,000, right? It's been a long day. Jesus had been healing and teaching, and the disciples said, tell everybody to go home. Tell them to go get some rest and to eat. They're probably hungry. It's been a long day, and Jesus says, so feed them. And they said, but all we have is this little bunch. And he goes, okay, feed them, right? And so they do and then find themselves picking up the leftovers. And we learn this perfect and beautiful message that if it's God ordained, there will be enough, right? There'll be enough time. There'll be enough money. There'll be enough food. There'll be enough if it's God ordained. So we can serve freely and know there'll be enough. And then, um, we see that he uses this breaking of bread, eating together as a time to teach, as a time for the people he's sitting with to grow and to learn. And that's in Luke 14. He's teaching them some social skills so that they don't embarrass themselves or him. Let's not be fools for Jesus, people. And he tells them, if you go to a party... Don't go sit at the, like, best place because what if you're not the most important person coming to this party? The host is going to have to go over and go, excuse me, that seat was saved for that person. Can you go find another one? And then you're going to find yourself sitting in the annex of this party. So just don't do that. Go sit out there. And then that host of the party might say, hey, friend. Come on up here and sit with me. Which position do you want to be in, right? So Jesus is teaching them, don't be embarrassing and foolish and think you're the best. Just be there. Be in fellowship. And what happens, happens with your place of honor at the table, right? And then he tells them somewhere, because I wasn't reading. Here we go. Then he tells them, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers, or relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you'll be repaid. That's great. All right. I invited you. You invite me. We're just going to keep sharing, sharing our lasagnas, right? But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you'll be blessed. And although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. And then we see him connecting in Luke 22, uh, verse 14. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. I have eagerly desired to sit with you and have this dinner and have this time together. 
gifts like in um, Luke 10, verse 41 and 42 with Mary and Martha, right? Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about so many things, but few things are needed for indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better and it will be not be taken from her because she was just sitting with him, right? Just there is a time to just sit and be with each other, with him. And then I think this is a fun story. Um, I love Resurrection Sunday. It's a Resurrection Sunday story. Luke 24, um, Jesus has been crucified. It's been three days. He's risen. The And the there's just sort of this hubbub going on about what's been going on and and these two people are walking along the road and a person comes to join them they don't realize it's Jesus and he says hey what's going on around here and they say oh my goodness where have you been right everybody knows what's going on here it's a thing there was Jesus he was crucified it was uh, we're, we're all upset but then it's been three days and these women went to the tomb and they said it was empty so some men went to go double check I'm just I don't think it goes quite that way <laughs> so, so they sorry my bad but it says something else like that but they the the men go and they come back and they say they saw the same thing and then um it's just it's crazy we don't know why this is happening and this stranger says, you don't, you don't know why this is happening. Did not somebody maybe tell you what was going to happen, how it was going to happen, and why it was happening? And they start to think, oh, oh that's right. And then Jesus goes on to retell and explain, you know, from beginning to end of, of what's been happening. And then, and then I love this. He says, As they approached the village which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going further. Okay, guys, I'll I'll see you later. And then what do they do? They show hospitality, and they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. Verse 30, when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. This moment, not when, not when he was telling the story, not when he's walking with them, but when he sat and reclined at the table and gave them the bread, they went, their eyes were opened and, oh, no way. Do you, and then he's gone, right? And so they're so excited. He disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? We knew something was happening, but we couldn't figure it out. And then there he was at the table, and we saw Jesus. I, I don't think that's coincident that it was over, over the breaking of bread and fulfilling the earlier, the earlier statement about breaking that bread. Then they they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It's true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. It can be really hard to slow down and take time for others. And it can be hard to be vulnerable to others, to be know them and to be known. But it's worth it. It's worth it to accept Jesus' love and sacrifice and to walk with him and abide with him and then to allow him to lead us to those friendships that he desires for us and commands for us. The friendships, as I've kind of gone through this um, anxious thoughts journey and um, watching Not Alone and reading Tony Evans' books, I've realized that I am getting to experience the reciprocity, right? My friends are loving me back, and I'm going to let them love me back and listen to my crazy thoughts and tell me that they're crazy thoughts and that everything's okay and we're going to be okay. But I'm also purposefully trying to turn that to moments of praise because God is ministering to me as well, bringing verses to me, showing me the truth. I'm having my own moments that I can also say, you know how I was telling you about this? This is what God showed me when I got home. Or this ver- I'm praying this verse as I'm working through this thought and trying to turn those, that weirdness right back, back to God because that is the thing that very clearly Satan doesn't like. He's, if you need respite from the battle, praise God. 
because the evil one doesn't want to be anywhere near worshiping God. It's disgusting to him. He doesn't want to have anything to do with it. So if you need respite, find a friend and worship the Lord. I, um, I, when the first time I heard this song that we'll play is uh, surround, Surrounded. <clears throat> I thought about, it just reminded me that we're not alone. Even if there aren't human beings, if we do feel physically alone, we know that God is with us. And we know that there are heavenly hosts surrounding us in our battle. And that when we can allow him to bring those other people to us, he'll bring us those people too in his time. But that we are never fighting this battle alone. So I wanted to just um, spend time in that. I don't know if you are currently in a time of peace and you are preparing for battle or if you're in battle and whether or not you see that you have an army with you. Because you do, because you're here today, right? We're here together. And you have... God himself. And he, Jesus says it over and over again. It's just not nice a nice thing to say. Jesus is with you in this battle. And heavenly hosts are with you in this battle. Thank you, God, for loving us first. Thank you for sacrificing for us first. Thank you that we can have courage because you have given us the armor we need to fight this battle. Thank you that you are our friend. Thank you that you have brought us into the inner circle and you are surrounding us, that we don't have to be afraid and that we have each other. We pray that you would help us know who our friends are, that you would help us know who to initiate friends with and how to be good friends and that your joy would be made complete in us and that others would see your truth because of that. In Jesus' name, amen. Fantastic week.